Book of Jasher, chapter 9, verse 35. And the Lord smote the three divisions that were, and he punished them according to their works and designs. Those who said, We will ascend to heaven and serve our gods, became like apes and elephants. And those who said, We will smite the heaven with arrows. The Lord killed them. One man through the hand of his neighbor. And the third division of those who said, We will ascend to heaven and fight against him. The Lord scattered them throughout the earth. And those who were left amongst them when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building, and they also became scattered upon the face of the earth. And they ceased building the city and the tower. Therefore he called that place Babel, For there the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Behold, it was at the east of the land of Shinar. And the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part thereof. And a fire also descended from heaven and burned the other third and the other third is left to this day and that is of that part which was aloft and its circumference is three days walk The book of Jasher speaks of men being turned into apes and elephants. These men in particular were the ones who were the most idolatrous. The men who sought to ascend to the top of the tower for the purpose of placing their own idols at the top and serving them. And those who wanted to fight against the Most High were scattered upon earth. As far as migration theories go, post Babel was probably the most important in the history of men and mankind. From that location, men would migrate back into their lands of inheritance. So was this the first out of Africa migration? That would explain the ape men. But that would also parallel much of the already proposed migration theory. However, biblically speaking, modern historians have never generally associated or hypothesized the Tower of Babel being in Africa. So even an African Babel would fit their evolutionary theory more closely. Conversely, it would make sense for a Japhethite to create a false Babel in Central Asia 
seeing as though it would hold some sort of geographic significance between the caves and the Indus Valley. But the real reason is these heathens are extremely cunning but incredibly sloppy in their deeds of deception. And the more one learns about their nature, the more their tactics of manipulation become blatantly obvious. tactics of manipulation are what they deem necessary for survival at the core of their being. Their nature is to hunt, kill, collect, and hoard not just the earth, but the souls and works of men. So that these men might do their bidding and forego eternity in the heavens for earthly pleasures and desires and an eternity in the abyss. Generations upon generations have all made their decisions and the fate of their children is already written. And when the children find out who they are and what their fathers have done, they will wish it better if they had never been born. Then they will curse their fathers for cursing them. Book of Enoch, chapter 15. But he raised me up and said to me with his voice, Enoch, I then heard, do not fear, Enoch, righteous man, scribe of righteousness. Come near to me and hear my voice. And tell the watchers of heaven on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede. It is meet for you that you intercede on behalf of man and not man on your behalf. For what reason have you abandoned the high, holy, and eternal heaven and slept with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of people, taking wives, acting like the children of earth, and begetting giant sons? Surely you, you used to be holy, spiritual, the living ones, possessing eternal life. But now you have defiled yourselves with women and with the blood of flesh, begotten children. You have lusted with the blood of the people, like them producing blood and flesh, which die and perish. On that account, I have given you wives in order that seeds might be sown upon them and children born by them, so that the deeds that are done upon earth will not be withheld from you. Indeed, you formerly were spiritual, having eternal life, 
and immortal in all the generations of the world. That is why I formerly did not make wives for you, for the dwelling of the spiritual beings of heaven is heaven. But now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits and the flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth because their dwelling shall be upon the earth and inside the earth. Evil spirits have come out of their bodies because from the day that they were created from the holy ones, they became the watchers. Their first origin is the spiritual foundation and they will become evil upon the earth and shall be called evil spirits the dwelling of the spiritual beings of heaven is heaven but the dwelling of the spirits of the earth which are born upon the earth is in the earth the spirits of the giants oppress each other they will corrupt fall be excited and fall upon the earth and call sorrow they eat no food nor become thirsty nor find obstacles and these spirits shall rise up against the children of the people and against the women because they have proceeded forth from them From the days since before the great flood until present day and until the end of days and the great age is consummated, the dwellings of the fleshly beings whom proceeded forth from the watchers have been relegated to the dwelling of earthly spirits. According to chapter 15 of Enoch, the union of the spirits and the flesh birthed evil spirits who will dwell upon the earth and inside the earth and will corrupt without incurring judgment. Because from the day they were created, the watchers are their first origin and spiritual foundation book of Enoch chapter 16 from the days of the slaughter and destruction and the death of the giants and the spiritual beings of the spirit and the flesh from which they have proceeded forth which will corrupt without incurring judgment they will corrupt until the day of the great conclusion until the great age is consummated, until everything is concluded upon the watchers and the wicked ones. And so to the watchers on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede, who were formerly in heaven, say to them, you were once in heaven, but not all the mysteries of heaven are open to you, and you only know the rejected mysteries, those ones you have broadcast to the women in the hardness of your hearts and by those mysteries the women and men multiply evil deeds upon the earth tell them therefore you will have no peace This spiritual foundation seems to be set upon the violation of natural law. 
by the mixing of the spiritual with the earthly. As a result of this, the offspring would be cursed and held within the earth without incurring judgment. So even after the flood and continuing until the end of days, these spirits are still walking the earth today. These are the spirits which were created in earth by the watchers and their dwelling since Genesis has been and will always be within the earth. This spiritual separation is the distinction between bloodlines upon the earth. The ones who were known as the giants before the flood were the result of the forbidden hybridization between the watchers and men. Their ancestors would become known later as the men of renown. And we know that their descendants would continue showing up even until the days after Exodus when the Anakim and the Philistines were reported to be so large that the Israelites seemed like grasshoppers in their presence. Although it is clear there is a connection between the past giants of the earth and the wandering spirits of Nephilim hybrids. Which other bloodlines of the sons of Noah could they represent? As discussed in earlier episodes, during the life and times of Alexander the Great, there were giants and barbarians who had been pushed beyond the northern reaches of the Caucasus Mountains and a wall erected to keep them out. These barbarian hordes were descendants of Japheth and Gog Magog. Could this mean that all bloodlines under Gog Magog are corrupted? And is there any indication that the Japhethic lineages were the only ones corrupted with Nephilim blood? We also know that giants are often associated with Canaanites and Philistines, which would be more closely related to the lineages of Ham or Canaan. These giants were called the sons of Anak in the book of Numbers, and also later mentioned in Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. Some scholars have directly related the sons of Anak to the Anunnaki. Quote, These Anakim seem to have come from Greece as members of the Sea Peoples Confederation, which caused the Egyptians so much trouble in the 14th century BC. End quote. 
Robert Graves, a 17th century British historian and novelist, identifies the Anakim, sons of Anak, with Anax, the giant ruler of the Anaktorians in Greek mythology. The sons of Anak seem to be exclusively tied to Mycenaean, Homeric, Greek, and even Anatolian civilizations. Quote, The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also afterwards. The sons of God went in unto the daughters of men, and they bore into them. They were the heroes, which in olden days were renowned men. End quote. Could these renowned men be the titans of Greek mythology? Many of the characteristics seem to fit accordingly. But just as in most of scripture, the true context is lost in translation. However, the historical record between Egypt, Greece, and Canaan is well documented. But are those documents even reliable? According to the Wilhelm Jacinius Hebrew Lexicon of 1833, the Semitic root KN, the root of Canaan, means to be low, humble, or subjugated. Without a doubt, the lineages of the ancient Canaanites draw specific connections to Greece, although geographically these areas were closely associated with Gog Magog. The fact must not be lost that these territories associated with Greece have undeniable connections to ancient Egypt. And from Egypt to India, Canaanite rituals have been an intricate part of their cultures from then until present day. And these Canaanites have been dwelling in the land of Shem since the days of old. But the lineages of Ham, Canaan, and Japheth aren't the only tainted bloodlines.
Book of Jubilees, Chapter 8. In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, Arpachshad took to himself a wife, and her name was Resuja, the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Elam. And she bare him a son in the third year in this week, and he called his name Cana. And the son grew, and his father taught him writing. And he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. And he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock. And he read what was thereon and he transcribed it and sinned, owning to it. For it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and moon and stars in all the signs of heaven and he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it for he was afraid to speak to Noah about it lest he should be angry with him on the account of it and in the 13th Jubilee in the second week thereof in the first year thereof he took to himself a wife and her name was Melka, the daughter of Madai, the son of Japheth. In the fourth year, he begot a son and called his name Shalah, for he said, truly, I have been sent. And in the fourth year, he was born and Shalah grew up and took to himself a wife. Her name was Muak, the daughter of Kased, his father's brother, in the one and thirteenth Jubilee, in the fifth week, in the first year thereof, and she bare him a son in the fifth year thereof, and called his name Eber. And he took unto himself a wife, her name was Azurad the daughter of Nebrod in the 32nd Jubilee in the seventh week in the third year thereof. And in the sixth year thereof she bare him a son and he called his name Peleg for in the days when he was born the children of Noah began to divide the earth amongst themselves. For this reason, he is called his name, Peleg. mentioned earlier, the sons of Madai dwelt in the lands of Shem. Arphaxad's son Canaan found writings from the watchers and thereby translated the signs of the luminaries to the children of men and sinned by doing so. Scholars have asserted that Canaan is the progenitor of the Chaldeans, who were known as the first magicians and soothsayers. Arphaxad is from the line of Shem.
The intermingling of genealogies in the written Torah is probably one of the most deceptive points of contention. But it doesn't stop there. Some biblical scholars attest that Nebrod in the book of Jubilees chapter 8 verses 6 through 9 is in fact Nimrod which means Azurad the wife of Eber and mother of Peleg is in fact a daughter of Nimrod thus making Nimrod and Abraham related through the matrilineal line of Azurad to complicate the context even further in the Septuagint Genesis chapter 10 verse 22 reads sons of Shem are Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram, and Canaan. Continuing into verse 24, and Arphaxad begot Canaan, and Canaan begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber, and to Eber were born two sons, the name of one Phaleg, because in his days the earth was divided, and the name of his brother Joktan. But when we jump back to Genesis chapter 9 in the very same Septuagint, we clearly read in verses 18 and 22 that indeed, as we initially understood before, Ham is the father of Canaan. However, when we look at the lineage of Arphaxad, his supposed son Canaan is suspiciously missing from the table of genealogy in chapter 8 verses 1 through 5. After it reads Canaan takes Melka, the daughter of Madai son of Japheth and they have a son Shelah who appears back in the Shemitic lineage. How is it that this Canaan or Canaan isn't mentioned in Genesis as being a son of Shem in any other version but the Septuagint? Continuing into verse 7 in chapter 8 of Jubilees, Eber, the son of Shelah, meaning the actual hidden grandson of Canaan or Canaan, took a wife, Azurai, who was a daughter of Nimrod. So the mother of Peleg is a daughter of Nimrod, and the grandfather of Eber, who is said to be the progenitor of the Hebrews could possibly be Canaan. According to the book of Jubilee chapter 8, Arphaxad had a son named Canaan who was not listed in the Genesis 9 table of nations anywhere other 
than the Septuagint. If Genesis 9 makes a clear point to distinguish the fact that Canaan is indeed the son of Ham, why isn't his lineage mentioned anywhere after its first mention? So one would know who exactly descends from the line of Canaan. What was the purpose for this omission? Is it possible that Canaan, son of Ham, and Canaan, son of Arphaxad, are in actuality the exact same person? And if this is true, why have their identities been hidden? These questions and more on the next episode of The Smartest Beast in the Field.